invites award-winning futurists and international keynote speaker, also known as the fanatical futurist, Mr. Matthew Griffin, who will make our opening speech on the theme of a step into the future, which is the main theme of our Congress. Can you hear me okay? There we go, we've now turned it on. So how are you all? So firstly, I have to share my sentiments and echo what the people before me basically actually said about the conflicts and the pain that we've actually seen in the region this year. So, so hopefully everything will resolve itself and hopefully the people who are affected by the recent earthquake are now recovering and getting back to some sense of normality. And certainly for our part at the 311 Institute, we were very happy to contribute our futures curriculums to the schools that were affected in the region, because as we'll see, the future never stands still. Now, my name is Matthew Griffin. I'm the CEO and founder of the 311 Institute, a global futures think tank. I look up to 50 years out I look across 600 emerging technologies. I look across hundreds of trends across lots of different regions and sectors. And really where we're sort of going to start today is even though we're going to be talking about the future, you're all wearing and using one of the oldest technologies known to mankind. Now, when we have a look in our distant past, it's estimated that the clothes that we're wearing were first invented around 100 to 500,000 years ago. So to put that into context, fashion as an industry is probably one of the oldest industries-ish. There is another old industry, which I won't mention. And it's over half a million years old. But what kind of staggers me is while clothes were invented up to half a million years ago, the shoe was, as far as we know, invented only 8,000 years ago. So it was invented in about 8,000 BC, so 10,000 years ago, which is a bit odd. Because when you actually have a look at that gap, we invented the first fashions 100 to 500,000 years ago, and then we had a 90 to 490,000 year gap when someone thought, but what about my feet? So the, when we have a look at shoes, they're 10,000 years old. Leather shoes were invented around three in 3,500 BC. So leather shoes were the next invention five and a half thousand years ago. And then footwear's next great invention, we can kind of argue, really happened in 1817 when a chap called William Young over in New York invented the mirrored shoe. So we went from wearing shoes basically that were the same on both feet to having a left shoe and a right shoe. So when we have a look at footwear innovation, today no one on the planet doesn't think about their footwear each day. So in early humanity, we had this almost half a million year gap when we didn't really think about what we put on our feet. And today, we're always thinking about what we're putting on our feet. So, as we look into the future, while shoes themselves are changing in terms of form, function, materials, manufacturing, strategies and processes and everything else, I still think it's very interesting that we are wearing one of the oldest technologies known to man. So in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about stepping into the future. 
And I think it's quite appropriate. And as quite a number of people before me have said, the world is changing around us. If you step back four to five years ago, and I said, we're going to have historically high inflation and interest rates, supply chain snarl-ups, wars, a pandemic, a pandemic, supply chain issues, etc., etc., global food shortages, historically high temperatures, many people would have thought that I'd be mad. And increasingly, when we have a look at the future, it's the preposterous futures, the odd futures, that are increasingly dominating our world. So I'm going to be talking through these things. So I'm going to be talking about future foundations. I'm going to show you the technologies and trends that you're all being subjected to. It's a bit of a fast run. We're going to have a look at global trends, market trends, the circular economy. We're going to have a look at the impact of European policy on the shoe industry or footwear industry. Next generation manufacturing. So we're going to be moving beyond industry four and we're going to be looking at industry five from a European perspective and then material innovation. And when we have a look at material innovation, it might not be what you think. Now, when we have a look at the future, as I say, I track hundreds of emerging technologies across 12 categories and hundreds of mega trends. And you can download these codexes basically from the QR code because frankly, while I'll talk about a number of them, there's no way that I can talk about all of them. And when we have a look at trends, all of these trends either affect you directly or indirectly. The CEOs of organizations today only control about 45% of what happens to their companies. The rest of what happens to your companies and your industry comes from external factors, things that happen to you because of something. So when we have a look at the trends, I tried to put this into a little video to just demonstrate the number of trends that you're having to think about. Because a trend in one industry, like energy, will affect your industry. So here we go. So in one minute, you saw about 300 megatrends. Climate change was one trend. Net zero was one trend. So when we're having a look at the world and how it affects us, it's no longer any good just to look at five or 10 trends. There, are, there is so much to look at now that the companies that I work with are very easily confused it's very difficult to see these trends. It's very difficult to understand what they really mean for your industry, your region, your profession. And then it's even harder to try to figure out your way out of these trends so that you're successful in the future. And if we have a look at some of the European regulations coming down the line, all of a sudden the industry can change almost overnight. And so how do you react at speed? But when we have a look at technologies, because we've got trends, and then we've got technologies. 
And when you have a look, for example, at your phones, they are combinations of technology. Footwear, we can argue, is a combination of technology. Material science, manufacturing new, and processes, and so on and so forth. So when we have a look at trends, this is a starburst. It goes up to 50 years out, and you'll see that all of these individual emerging technologies will mature in a particular way. Each emerging technology has got an addressable market opportunity of about half a trillion dollars. Each technology on this starburst can either affect one industry or every industry. Artificial intelligence is just one. But if we have a look at the technologies that are affecting your industry in the near term, the medium term, and then the long term, we've got advanced manufacturing. So we have organizations like Nike and Adidas and Under Armour and even LVMH and Gucci and those kinds of organizations who are increasingly playing around with 3D printing. So 3D printing affects the $10 trillion manufacturing industry. And increasingly, there are companies within the footwear industry that see these advanced manufacturing technologies as their future tickets. They are plowing tens of billions of dollars basically into these technologies. We even have molecular assemblers deeper into the future. But when we start having a look, we've got compute. So compute is changing as well. We've got the compute the computer chips that are in our smartphones. But increasingly, we're developing plastic computer chips that you put into clothing. We've got some interesting material innovations when it comes to computing. So we even have liquid computing and DNA and biological computing coming through. So when we actually have a look at compute, compute is increasingly coming to your clothing and your footwear, if you want it to, if you bake it in. 5G and 6G technologies, because if I'm walking around the stage and my shoes are tracking my movements, you need to be able to connect to fast, high-speed networks. When we have a look at electronics, we've got traditional electronic systems like the components, again, in your smartphone and in the cameras. But we've also got flexible computing and flexible electronics. So increasingly, we are building flexible electronics into, for example, sportswear that you can curl and flex tens of thousands of times, and they will read information from your body. When we have a look at intelligence, we have traditional artificial intelligence, which you can use within your businesses to optimize your processes, to understand your customers better, to service your customers better, to assess the risks in your supply chains faster. So we have artificial intelligence in the back office but we also have it in the front office at the customer experience and customer service end. But we also have artificial intelligence in the design process as well of the footwear industry. And I will show you that. When we have a look at materials, a lot of people overlook materials. But there are lots of new innovative materials coming down the line. And I'll go through those in a bit. And then when we have a look at robots and robotics, increasingly we are trying to roboticize the fashion industry. We're trying to roboticize the footwear industry. But when you combine a traditional robot with artificial intelligence and machine vision, that robot gains a set of new skills which in many ways transform the industry. So for example, when we have a look at the rob 
at robotics. Nike have developed a robot that puts a shoe together. It's a traditional trainer. It can assemble 500 to 600 shoes an hour. And I'll talk about that in a bit. But it's not just enough to innovate on the robotics side from a manufacturing perspective. You have to innovate the materials. Because in the fashion industry, one of the biggest problems that we actually have bringing robotics into the fashion industry is fabric is floppy. It's very difficult for a robot to grip and manipulate fabric. And then we've got user experiences. And when we have a look at the user experience, there are new markets opening up. And I'll talk about that. Depending on the market that you serve, you now have the opportunity not to sell one thing, one pair of shoes. You have the opportunity to sell that three times to the same customer. So when we have a look at the user experience, I'll go into that in a bit. But you combine all those different technologies together, and you change what you produce, how you produce it, and how you design it, and then how you sell it, and who you sell it to. And you change your business models. So when we have a look at global trends up to 2030, there's a staggering amount going on. When we have a look at just the economic trends, we've got the cost of living crisis. The consumers that you are selling to now have more debt than ever before. Each household globally has about 30 to 40% more debt than they've ever had, which means that spending on items, products, suddenly gets depressed. We've got economic uncertainty. There is always talk now of when we go into a global recession. And in Europe, as well as other parts of the world, we're continually teetering on that brink of are we in a recession, aren't we in a recession? And again, from a consumer perspective, when you have economic uncertainty, when you have uncertainty about job loss, income, you save, you reduce your spending. We've got global GDP growth, which at the moment is running at about 3 to 4%, so that's actually ticking along okay. But as we head towards 2030, we expect global GDP to increase by about 10%. And as we head to the year 2050, GDP will double, and 80% of GDP will come from 32 countries. So those countries will more than likely be your main markets. We've got high inflation rates and high interest rates. With high inflation rates, your the cost of your materials has increased a lot. And so you're having to pass that on. Your cost of energy, if you use gas-fired electricity generation, depending where you live, could have increased by 250%. So all these get passed on. So this is kind of that macroeconomic storm where really we should see a depression in spending. And then high interest rates, you're paying more for your loans, your credit cards, and your mortgages. And the advice that consumers are being given is pay off your debt. Because debt today is expensive. Debt during the pandemic was cheap. So from a business perspective and a personal perspective, high interest rates are problematic. Now when we have a look at the environment, we've got climate change. Now as we start stretching beyond 2050, we've got about 54 global megacities. Those megacities house about a billion people. And by 2040, 2050, it's estimated that we will see a huge increase in both economic migration and environmental migration of people. Because we estimate that by 2050, 600 million people could be displaced in megacities. 
like Shanghai, like Miami, like London, like Jakarta, because the sea is already coming over the walls. New York. When we have a look at resource scarcity, as I travel around the world, so I work with most of the world's governments now, the one priority that the vast majority of governments have is securing resources, energy resources, food resources, metals and materials and commodity resources. So you'll see that. So, for example, increasingly within Europe, plastic and materials is seen not as waste, but it's seen as a material resource that Europe wants to keep. They don't want their materials to be exported to, say, the Philippines for processing. So when we have a look at resource scarcity, this is driving new regulations and new policies, and I'll go into those in a bit. Sustainability, that's a big topic. I'll dive into that in a little bit. And then water scarcity and stress. And if you have a look at the leather industry, for example, it uses huge amounts of water. So by 2030, the United Nations estimates that over 130 countries will have water stress, where water stress is the term they use when you have problems growing crops. We're seeing that in, in Istanbul right now. We see it across Europe. We see it across the Middle East. We see it globally. So water scarcity will increasingly be a problem. When we have a look at politics, we've got Belt and Road Initiatives. You've got China spending about one to $1.5 trillion building out new ports, new roads, new rail infrastructure, especially in the global south, which actually helps open new markets for you, gives you better access, lowers your cost of access. And in Europe, Europe has now committed half a trillion dollars to their own Belt and Road Initiative to the global south as well. When we ha have a look at governments, we have historically high public debt. Now, what we mean by this is, again, governments around the world, post-pandemic, are now carrying about an extra, again, 30% of public debt. Now, you might not think this, uh, that this affects you, but if a government in a region has a lot of debt, they need to pay it back. The way they do that is by raising indirect taxes. So they might not raise direct taxes, but they will raise indirect taxes, things like corporation tax, and I'll go into that in a bit. Net zero pledges. We're seeing strategic dislocation. So different countries, both in Asia as well as Europe, Latin America, North America, are increasingly moving out of, an, out of regions because they are de-risking their supply chains. So we're seeing a lot of outflows from China, for example, on the manufacturing front and increasingly into India and Pakistan, uh, as well as Vietnam and so on and so forth. So as we see the world moving to a multipolar world, increasingly where you get your goods from, the markets you have access to, where you place your factories, etc., is changing. And when we have a look at strategic de-risking, Europe's, most of Europe's policies now aren't really about divorcing from different countries. They're about de-risking their exposure to different countries. And again, that drives government policy, which then affects you. When we have a look at society, we have an aging population so it doesn't really matter which country you look at, all of our populations are aging. So your customer bases are aging. The products that you sell will change in terms of the ratios. We have an algorithmic society. Now you might not affect, think this affects you, 
But if I'm looking for footwear and I go to, say, Amazon or I go to Alibaba, increasingly, when I'm looking for a product, a shoe, artificial intelligence is recommending products to me. And it might not recommend your brand to me. It might recommend someone else's brand to me. So the way that you sell your products, the way you market your products, how customers find your products are changing. And when we have a look at conscious consumerism, typically about 65 to 95% of younger generations believe that traditional capitalism is responsible for treating workers as a commodity and the planet as a commodity. So this is where, when we have a look at younger generations like Gen Z, Gen Alpha, increasingly they are aligning with sustainable, ethical, purpose-led brands. So it's not just about sustainability, it's about purpose. Who do you support? What are your values as a company? Patagonia is a great example. Patagonia went from almost nothing to a $4 billion business, really because of its approach to conscious consumerism and its values. We see jobs automation. Every government that I talk to on the planet, whether it's the Chinese government, whether it's the Indian government, whether it's the European governments or the American governments, everyone's worried about job automation. And then we have, in Asia, a massive emerging middle class. So over the next 10 years, it's estimated that the middle class in Asia will grow by 600 million people. So that's 600 million people with more disposable income who want to buy better products, fancier products, more fashionable products maybe, not just the basics. So this opens up new market opportunities. Now, when we have a look at market trends, 62% of people in Europe say they actually prioritize buying new footwear, new shoes, over buying other clothes. So these are from surveys that we've seen with PwC. So 62% of people, when they're thinking about buying a product, they think about buying shoes before buying a new shirt, a new T-shirt, a new dress, a new whatever it happens to be. Which shows you just how far we've come in half a million years. Because we spent almost half a million years not really thinking about what we're putting on our feet. And now, it's pretty much the only thing that we're really thinking about. So that's future market opportunity. So as I mentioned earlier, we're seeing ethical capitalism on the rise. So this is where increasingly, from a European perspective, from a European government perspective, we talk about zero waste. But some of the new language that's coming through in the governments that I talk to is the top one. Zero harm. Now, zero harm is an interesting topic because what the European Union are really saying here is they're saying, when you are designing your products and thinking about their disposal and all that kind of stuff, we want you to think consciously about the harm that those products will cause to the environment either now or in the future. And this really comes from the microplastics, that sort of trend. Because within Europe, they've said, well, when we dispose, for example, of shoes, you know, we have a lot of microplastics. Those microplastics enter our waterways, enter our food chain, and cause harm. So the use of the term zero harm 
from a European perspective, you'll expect to see this coming up more and more in legislation. So when you're thinking about the products you design, the materials you use, your manufacturing processes, but also how you, shall we say, what happens to those products at the end of their life, the European Union's going to be putting a microscope on you more and more. And it's mainly because of this. Increasingly, governments around the world, and we'll see this at COP28 in Dubai at the start in almost a month now, people are increasingly talking about people, planet, and purpose. Because it's all very well as a society having a fit functioning society, but if our planet is burning and flooding at the same time, then we're going to get ill. So for example, in Europe, we now see about five million people a year dying in Europe because of heat. So this is, you combine these trends together and you now get inside the head of a policymaker in Brussels. And I said, you have three opportunities to sell to the customer. You can sell your physical product to the customer. If this is Adidas, this is your trainer. This is your running shoe. You can sell a digital product to that same customer. So again, if you're Adidas, you sell a fitness or a running subscription to Runtastic. But we now have virtual. These are three distinctly different economies. The digital economy and the virtual economy are separate. They are not the same. Virtual is not digital and digital is not virtual. So separate your thinking. In the virtual world, this is where we now sell you a pair of virtual sneakers. And a little while ago, Christine Lagarde, when I was with Adidas in Vienna, she said, in the morning, she said, digital assets are worthless. And I was sitting down with the CFO of Adidas and the CEO of Adidas at the time, and they said, they're not worthless because we've just sold $35 million worth of virtual sneakers in three hours. So we are selling virtual shoes because if you've got kids who are playing Roblox or Minecraft or Fortnite, they're buying for their avatars. So the footwear industry is already extending into the virtual realm. When we have a look at new ways to enhance the customer experience, we have augmented reality. We can use these tablets, you can select your shoes, your trainers, whatever it happens to be. You can try them on virtually. But now you could also start personalizing them virtually as well. And if the factories are good enough and quick enough and can do small batch runs, you can sell personalized trainers on demand. And more on that later. We've got NFTs. Again, companies like Adidas and Nike, Nike with RKFT, they've been selling NFTs like crazy. You know, we can sell collectibles. And when we actually have a look at customization, customization is interesting. Manufacturing technology is starting to get to the point where we can do small individual batch runs cheaper than ever before, especially as we look at automation, optimization, artificial intelligence, and robotics, and so forth. Globally, it's estimated about 75% of the consumers that you're selling to would like to buy a customized or personalized product and they'll pay more for it. And I've got examples of that. But when we have a look at customer retention, 75% of the people who buy customized shoes and customized products will recommend those companies to their friends. So customization 
personalization is very much a trend of now. And we see that everywhere. No one really wants to be the same as everyone else, even though as uh, gentlemen we all wear the same suits. <laughs> now, when we have a look at the circular economy, so I do a lot of work with the, the global recycling industry. Every year, globally, we're producing about 23 billion pairs of shoes. And you know, or you should probably know what the next slide is. Because 22 billion pairs of those 23 billion pairs end up in landfill. Shoes are one of the most complex products to recycle. If I've got a sweater and it's made of polyester, I throw it in the, in the recycling bin, it goes to a recycler who then uses chemical recycling processes just to recycle the polymers. With shoes, particularly the soles of shoes, they're made up of so many different materials, they're hard to separate. But most consumers just never bother. So the recycling companies, so I work with global recyclers, they never see 22 billion pairs of shoes. So the European Union has just kicked off a variety of recycling centers around the world, and we were talking about this yesterday. And ironically, the European Union is focusing on recycling fashion, you know, so sweaters and jackets and jeans and everything else, and actually haven't, left, haven't actually put you in the consortium. The EU basically apparently basically has said, well, when it comes to recycling footwear, you know, come back later. That's a horrible statistic. But we are doing something. Now, when we have a look at the circular economy, this is where we look at waste as a design failure. So the more waste that you have throughout the entire life of that product, whether it's sourcing material, using material in the manufacturing process, waste is a design failure. So when we think about the circular economy, it's new attitude, new design, and new thinking. And it's, the reason why it's a new attitude is because if you really want to create circular economy products, you've got to have the right culture in the business. You've got to want to do it attitude. It's new design because we, the way that we design the shoes, the materials that we use, how we stitch and sew and glue the shoes together matters. And it's new thinking because it breaks with tradition. Now, earlier on I mentioned that sustainability was a trend. We know this. I work with pretty much all of the world's largest investment organizations, companies like Citi, UBS, Legal and General, Blackstone, BlackRock. And increasingly, the investors, the people who buy the shares in your companies, and they now hold about $50 trillion worth of assets in the ESG space. If your company is not able to prove that you take sustainability seriously, the big global asset managers and funds will likely dump you from their portfolios. So this is one of those indirect pressures. If you go, well, we just don't care about sustainability, then the investors are simply, increasingly the investors will just say, well, we're not investing in you then. So ESG is an investment metric. Now, when we have a look at recycling, when I talk to the recyclers, we're recycling about 8% of everything that we use on the planet. We use 100 billion tons of product a year. We recycle 312 million tons of product a year. Not just footwear, but everything. Electronics, the whole lot. How many of you have ever spoken to a recycling company when you're designing your new product? and said, if we design our product in this way, how easy is this for you to recycle? Because I'm tempted to say none of you have. 
Because the recycling companies that I work with say, the people making the products never ever come to us and ask us how easy this stuff is to recycle. They leave us with the problem. Which is why when it comes to shoes, we just shred them all. Because they've not been designed in a way that helps us. But when we have a look at biological recycling, we can take shoes now and other things and we can use enzymes to break down all of the plastics. So we've got biological recycling. We've got new catalysts when we talk about chemical recycling. So these catalysts depolymerize plastics into their base constituents faster than ever before. So recycling technology is also evolving. And then when we actually have a look at other chemical recycling, especially in Europe, we're trying to make chemical recycling less toxic. So now we're using plant-based solvents to dissolve the materials that you're using to make your products. Now when we have a look at European policy, firstly the EU is just educating everybody. Be ethical, buy sustainably, buy from brands that are sustainable, that look after and care about the planet, that kind of stuff. And the messages are generally getting through. We're seeing that in developed nations, basically where we're moving the dial. The European Union as well, basically, is also saying, well, you can be sustainable because it's kind of the right thing to do. But if you're not, then we're going to tax you. And where the European Union goes on taxes is packaging. So increasingly more of you will be using cardboard packaging and thinking about the packaging and the materials that you're using there. European governments basically will increase VAT. So we're seeing that across a couple of EU governments being tabled at the moment where for example, even in the UK, we're thinking about increasing VAT on goods and waste disposal fees. So can you imagine the European Union coming after you and saying, so as an industry, you know, you make products, but 22 billion pairs of shoes go into landfill. And we know it's not really your fault. We know that the consumers are just putting shoes in the bin. So it's not you, but what would happen if the European Union started carrying out on their threat of waste disposal fees, where they say, we've seen so many pairs of shoes going into landfill. In the UK, one county council recently spent four million pounds having to sort out all their recycling because people have mucked it all up. What would happen if the European Union said, we're having to pay to process all this landfill. We're going to put that back as a tax on you. Because they're thinking about that and some other things. Now, the European Union, this is the CBAM policy. The European Union has traditionally got rather fed up of organizations polluting. And so what the EU would traditionally do is they would say, if you wanted to set up a factory in Germany to produce footwear, then you've got to have very low CO2 emissions. And some companies would just say, being green is expensive. We need better plant machinery, better factory products and everything else. So what they do is they say, we're not going to set up in Berlin. We're going to set up in Asia somewhere where the environmental regulations are maybe less strong. Not weak, but less strong. And the European Union actually kept getting fed up of losing jobs and economic opportunity to other countries. So the CBAM policy now means that if you're buying in products as part of your supply chain, and they're coming from another country, but, that, but those products have been created and they emit loads of carbon dioxide during the production process. When you bring them into the European Union, the EU will tax you. So you might be 
creating lots of emissions in your supply chain in Asia, and in the past you could get away with it. Now the EU is looking at your entire scope one, scope two, scope three emissions and is saying, if you are bringing products into the, into the European Union that have generated carbon dioxide, like steel and everything else, we are going to tax you on the import. Now, on the one hand, this means that you now start sourcing more goods and products internally within Europe. Or you have to start sourcing from greener suppliers outside of Europe to avoid this tax. Now, the EU has also got a circular economy action plan. So this is a general plan in Brussels, um, promoting sustainability, reducing waste, and supporting recycling. So this is, this is almost the EU attitude. It's not quite a policy, but it's an attitude. It's, we will promote sustainable everything, we will reduce waste, and we will support recycling. And the reason for this is because the EU increasingly sees the green economy as being able to bring in new jobs. It's a new industry. The European Union and the UK want to be at the center. They want to be at the heart of the new green industry to create wealth and jobs for the regions. So this is why they, these policies now have teeth. I do a lot of work with the big four, so Ernst & Young, KPMG, PwC, Deloitte. If, you think, if, you're, if you're not sustainable or don't take ESG seriously, next year you are going to have to report everything that you're doing to the European Union, all your ESG metrics. Companies like Ernst & Young say that very few companies are ready for this. The Corporate Sustainability Reporting Directive so it's another policy. If you aren't able to demonstrate to the European Union that you are green, you know, then you're going to get hit with fines. We have the Eco Design Directive. So this is where they look at the energy efficiency of your products. Not your business, your products. But then also look at product performance. So this is where they're looking at what is the product you're selling, how durable and reliable is it? How long is it designed to last? Because products that have a short shelf life increasingly are going to be taxed. So the European Union, you can see just with these slides, they're going after the green agenda in a very big way. If you aren't green, if your supply chains aren't green, you will get taxed. That means your products basically are going to be more expensive. You'll be more uncompetitive in the European market. And then we have the sustainable and circular textile strategy. And it's exactly what it says on the tin. Now, originally, it wasn't thought that the footwear industry, textiles for the footwear industry, was included in this directive, but they are. So if the materials that you use aren't increasingly durable, reusable and recyclable, you're not going to like the EU very much. There's a gist here. Now, when we have a look at manufacturing, I mean, there's a lot going on. You, know, you can see from this, there's a lot going on. And a lot, most of this so far hasn't been in your control. You've got to go with the flow. But when we have a look at next generation manufacturing, again, in Europe, we're moving from industry four to industry five policies. So industry four was very much about smart factories, automation, internet of things, robotics. It was about tech. The European Union is getting increasingly worried about the effect of automation in the manufacturing sector and the impact that automation will have on jobs, wage growth, and everything else. So their new policy is Industry 5, and Industry 5 
looks much more closely at how technology and humans work together for the benefit of the human. So human-centric integration. You can kind of think of industry as industry five is bringing the people back into the factories that industry four started taking out. <clears throat> but you'll see a lot more innovation and policies coming out around that. Now, we talk about artificial intelligence a lot. We can use AI to improve your company's processes and all that sort of stuff, and insights and big data. But what about using generative artificial intelligence for design? <clears throat> so in the footwear industry, you might recognize this sort of thing. It's a trainer, a running shoe. But it was designed by an artificial intelligence. Now normally, Under Armour tell me that to go from a blank page in a book to having a shoe on the shelf that a customer can buy normally takes them 18 months. This shoe is the Architect sneaker. It's $300 and it's sold out fast. It was designed by an artificial intelligence in two hours. It's 3D printable. But if you have a look at the sole, Under Armour wondered basically why the sole looked like that. And they queried the AI and they said, why did you design a sole, a lower, that looks like this? And the AI came back and said, well, I looked at all these different designs in nature and manufacturing and product design and everything else. And actually, I think humans are like trees. Trees have roots. So as humans, we are a bit like a tree. We're tall and we've got a narrow base. So the AI designed a lower with tree roots. And it is the highest performing sneaker that Under Armour had at the time. <clears throat> so we've also got AI designing rocket engines and we've also got AI designing cars. So are you actually playing around with the use of artificial intelligence to design your next product? Because not only is it cheaper, it's also faster and then you can get it to market faster. And if you had these CAD files, increasingly, you can 3D print. When we have a look at Adidas, Adidas are now trying to 3D print more and more products, and we'll come on to that. When we have a look at things like virtual reality design, we've got more design studios in Europe now that are just full digital, and you can personalize it as much as you like. When we have a look at companies like Adidas, <clears throat> this is a lower. It's made on demand. It takes about three seconds to make, and that's an exaggeration. So Adidas have an ambition. At the moment, they generally import hundreds of millions of shoes from China. They put those into their stores, and they sell some of those products as inventory, but the other 40 to 60% of inventory that they don't sell goes to landfill, just gets shredded, right? It is the industry's way. It's all industry's way, really. By being able to 3D print shoes in the backs of their stores, Adidas do a number of things. Firstly, they eliminate almost their entire global supply chain for materials. They eliminate almost all of their global logistics. Think about the cost saving there, let alone carbon footprint saving. You design your trainer and then it prints off in the back of the store. So now, as a consumer, I'm personalizing my shoe, which is nice. But because we have the manufacturing technologies coming through at a very low level, they're, they're ramping. When Adidas sell a personalized sneaker, they make about 60% more profit. 
So Adidas increasingly will carry less inventory, make more profit, while also eliminating all of the cost associated with their supply chain and logistics, while also meeting the European Union's directives of being green and pleasing the customer. So in Adidas's case, this lower was made by this company called Carbon. So this is Carbon. It's not 3D printing. It is holographic printing. Welcome to Carbon. We're a technology company changing the way the world makes things. Specifically, 3D printed things. We didn't start out trying to change manufacturing forever. We didn't? No, we didn't. We started with the simple goal of making 3D printed parts better. It's 25 to 100 times faster, which is game changing. But we quickly realized that with our combination of technology and materials, we could make real parts with mechanical properties and surface finishes that make injection molded plastics obsolete by comparison. Embracing the idea that speed to production isn't an obstacle anymore is the only way forward. And our partners share our enthusiasm for reinventing the rules. Partners who are manufacturing at scale, making millions of real products. Like us? Yeah, like you. In partnership with Adidas, we've created a midsole that shouldn't exist so that they can make a shoe that shouldn't exist. Light, super flexible, highly durable, and printed straight from liquid. A marvel of design and function, this shoe defies logic. And whether you want to make one or one million, this is true, customizable, and on-demand mass manufacturing. This is not a publicity stunt. This is a revolution. And we're just getting started. Stop prototyping. Start producing. So while I appreciate that you all make different kinds of footwear, when we have a look at the sportswear companies, they're trying to eliminate their entire global supply chains. They're trying to roboticize everything. So there are certainly organizations to pay attention to when it comes to material innovation, product design, and so on and so forth. And increasingly, they will have artificial intelligence design the sneaker using materials that are 3D printable or can be holographically printed, and then they will just print them off in the back. And you can apply this to different kinds of the footwear industry as well. Not all in all parts, but increasingly there are some similarities. Now when we have a look at business models, companies like Adidas and others as part of the circular economy are trying to sell shoes as a subscription. Because if I sell shoes as a, as a subscription, we're trying to solve the landfill problem. However, what if you just never ever sold your shoes? What if you literally gave them away? And I know many of you will never do this. Don't worry. Human nature, human culture basically means that many of you will never do this. But when we have a look at smart shoes, for example, I broke both ankles about two years ago. So when I'm walking around, I actually walk lopsided. So I could do with a pair of personalized shoes, proper insoles, that kind of stuff. Because shoes are important. If you wear the wrong shoes, your entire kinetic chain gets knocked out. If you wear the wrong shoes, you start doing this. You end up with a bad back, a bad hip, slouchy shoulders. So increasingly, when we have a look at wearable technology, if you actually had smart shoes, if I had smart shoes, I know basically that I wear out my left shoe now faster than my right shoe because I'm walking like this. I know basically that in 10 to 20 years I'm going to have a problem with this ankle. Now when we have a look at smart shoes, increasingly they can say, they can feed back data and say, Matt, you're walking like this. Your gait is wrong. That can be fed back to you as a manufacturer to manufacture a personalized shoe. The text there already. So now I walk properly. So in 20 years time, I don't end up having ankle surgery. I don't end up seeing the chiropractor 
every two weeks to sort my back out. But you sell smart shoes as a subscription. Increasingly, could you become a wellness company? Because the blood flow that go through your feet, you can read people's heart rates. You can tell what they've had for breakfast. You can tell how healthy they are. You can tell if someone is happy or sad wearing your shoes. Because if you're, if you're happy and alert, we're like this, aren't we? We're like, hey, great, you know, we're standing upright. If I'm depressed, I'm like this. I change the foot pressure in my shoe. So by walking around like this, if you have sensors in your, in your shoes, I can tell you're depressed. Now, as a company, you can say, Matt, we noticed that you're depressed. Should we make an intervention? There are brand new business models emerging all around the world because we can turn everything intelligent. And then from a company perspective, it's what can we do, how do we do it, and why should we bother? Now, when we have a look at countering counterfeiting, increasingly we have DNA tags. If you want to know that the materials that you're buying have come from a very specific region of the planet and they've been ethically sourced, you can put a DNA tag into all of your products. They're also called molecular tags. This is the ultimate in provenance and tracking. And then when we have a look at Europe, Europe is increasingly, to counter counterfeiters, are increasingly saying that you need to create digital twins of your products and you need to put your products onto the blockchain so that we know basically that these are an original pair of whatever manufacturer they are and they're not counterfeit. Now, if you wonder why this is important, let me give you some stats. Did you know that the global serious organized crime industry has revenues, as far as we can tell, of six trillion, with a T, dollars? Did you know that serious organized crime is growing at 19% per year? And did you know that counterfeiting, you probably do know, counterfeiting is one of the best ways that serious organized crime groups fund their activities? Whether it's murder, blackmail, whether it's child trafficking, drug trafficking, and everything else. So when we have a look at this and we say, but why does the EU care about footwear or fashion counterfeiting or product counterfeiting? It's not because they don't trust you. It's because they're trying to eliminate criminals' income streams. This is a whole massive area, basically, with Europol and these other companies. And then finally, material innovation. Now, if we really do want to be responsible, if we do really want products to be able to be recyclable and all that kind of stuff and have a useful life, the fact of the matter is that we need new materials. So in this particular case, this Adidas shoe, because Adidas particularly play around with, with the circular economy and different bits, which is why I pick on Adidas. This shoe is one material. You can put it straight into a recycling bin and then using chemical recycling, it just ends up becoming polymers again and then it comes back to you. When we have a look at cotton, cotton uses huge amounts of water. But in the European Union, we can now make cotton from algae that's got exactly the same properties but we can grow it in the building over there. We can eliminate cotton's entire supply chain, we can eliminate cotton, and we can also eliminate all of the water that cotton needs to grow. New adhesives. One of the recycling industry's biggest bugbears is they get products in, and those products are very, very hard to separate into their component materials and parts. So new adhesives mean that when your shoe goes to recycling, 
we can use one plant-based chemical, the adhesive just evaporates, and now we've got all the individual parts of the shoe. And we can use robots to sort the materials of that shoe out. BMW are using adhesives now to glue their cars together. Bacterial dyes and polymers. If you go to different parts of India and you say, what are next season's fashion colors? There are rivers in India that flow red and green and yellow and blue because the dyes that we use within the fashion industry, including leathers and everything else, are generally toxic, and they flow into the rivers and the ecosystem. So now we can actually create those same dyes that you use to color your products from bacteria. Completely organic, zero harm to the environment because they're grown in bats. We have cellular leathers. Now, I know some of you work in the leather industry. I'm fully aware of that. So this is where attitude kind of comes in. So cellular, cellular leather, with companies like Modern Meadow, we've got Gucci that are now starting to invest in, modern, in uh, cellular, cellular leathers. This is where we take a cell from a cow or an animal, put it into an advanced manufacturing product called a bioreactor, and produce leather. Okay? And we can discuss true leather, fake leather, whatever, as much as you like. However, we can again grow that in the building next door, and we can grow it with different grains and textures and softness and everything else. Now, from a traditional industry perspective, you can see this as being a threat. It's still slow, it's still a small industry. You can see it as a threat, or you can see it as an opportunity. If you're in the leather industry, have you explored this area? Have you thought about this could be your ne new next big business. You have traditional leather for artisans and you know, people who want traditional leather from actual cows from Brazil or Iran or wherever it happens to be. And we have cellular leather because increasingly the European Union likes this sort of stuff. So you've got a new opportunity. When we look at e-inks and atomic displays, Increasingly, display technology from companies like Samsung, you know, we see flexible screens now. We're starting to see flexible screens and e-ink displays emerging on trainers and footwear. And I just click my fingers, and all of a sudden, my trainer is a completely different color. So these, again, are upticking. So the technology is maturing, but this is, we're talking about the future here. But these exist today, and they're being put into footwear today and you can customize them in any way that you want. <clears throat> Kinetic fabrics, just for a bit of fun. With Adidas, we've had a couple of companies that have developed fabrics that play sounds. So now imagine you're going for a run or whatever it happens to be, and you can feel the beat in your shoes. That's a bit of fun, but nevertheless, when we have a look at material innovation, there's a lot of stuff going on that just seems weird, but it's possibly an opportunity. Programmable inks. These are quite fun. Photochromic inks. When you have a look at the wing of a butterfly, butterfly wings never, ever fade, right? Never fade. So increasingly, we have environmentally friendly photochromic inks that you can use in whatever purpose you want, but they never, ever fade. We've got new plastics, so we've got biodegradable plastics, we've got plas plastics made out of carbon dioxide. So now imagine, if you've used plastics or polymers, basically, to make your shoes, imagine the European Union saying, it's horrible that you're using plastic. And you go, well, actually, these are biodegradable, Infinitely recyclable, that's a skill. Oh, and we actually make our plastics using carbon dioxide, so we're a carbon negative company. 
We've also got products from fungi, mushrooms, and corn. And then the last slide, we also have fabrics that literally are artificial intelligences. So these are, these are the epitome of smart fabrics, made by companies like MIT that we'll hear from later. But these smart fabrics have neural networks and compute in the fabric. So if, you, if you're wearing a gentleman's shirt and you do this, that's what they feel like, except they have sensors and compute and artificial intelligence in that fabric. So now we go back to the smart footwear piece that I was talking about, where my, these shoes are dumb. I bought these, basically they were about 100 pounds. If these were smart shoes and I had a subscription, I mean, I've had these like six years, they've been quite good, they've done thousands of miles. If these were as a subscription, as a company, Jones the bootmaker wouldn't have made about 60 pounds profit. They'd be making about 600 pounds profit, if not a couple of thousand pounds profit because I'm paying as a subscription, because it's part of my health plan. And now I send the data from this to my health plan, and my health plan says, yeah, Matt's walking around stage, we know how much he's moved, we're going to lower his health insurance. So when we have a look at the future of footwear, when we have a look at the future of everything, there's a lot going on. But there's a lot of opportunity, if you can understand it. So I hope you enjoyed the presentation, and that's it from me, and I think we've got Q&A now, <laughs> so thank you. So you would like to add Q&A parts well, I think they want to here, see right? it, so uh, you don't have to, but uh, does anyone have any questions? If not, then that's fine. It's quite hot on stage. Oh, uh, no, there is one. There you go. <laughs> Hello. <laughs> he might need a microphone. Shout. This is, this is Atira. Just a question. What does the future say about the uh, leathers from the, the skins of the animals if the uh, <laughs> production goes to cellular leathers? Uh, is there any forecast for that also? Yeah. So, so traditional leather, as in also traditional cows, are perfectly safe for now. Um, when we have a look at cows, there are actually about 20 billion cows on the planet. Uh, so I'm going to be at COP28 in Dubai at the start of December. And there's a huge amount of conversation about, should we say, alternative foods. You know, so for example, plant-based burgers, cellular burgers, because we can also make beef burgers in the lab and everything else. But it's such a low ticking trend that cows will be in existence basically for decades to come. But when we actually have a look at, so, so tradition, the sources of traditional leather are not under threat whatsoever at all. The businesses are still viable for decades. However, when you start having a look at some of the political pressure to do things differently, is probably the best way to put it. There's a lot of political pressure, especially in the European Union, to try to decarbonize everything. And that includes cows. Because if we have a look at it from a consumer perspective as well, um, increasingly companies like LVMH are having problems uh, even with leather, because people, you know, we've got people saying, well, leather comes from a cow. You know, meat comes from a cow, etc. Um, so there's an increasing amount of consumer pressure to find alternative sources of traditional materials, which is why we've actually seen a lot of these startups come into being. Uh, we've also seen around $200 billion worth of investment in that space. Because it's not just really, leather is one of the byproducts, but really we're seeing the entire global food production system change. So because the agricultural industry is changing and because consumer behaviors are changing, that inevitably then has, an, has a knock-on effect to the leather industry, but also presents the leather industry with an opportunity. 
Because if you have a look at Gucci, for example, Gucci are now starting to say, well, we can provide you know, cellular leather. De Beers is another classic example. We used to be able to make, well, De Beers traditionally would mine diamonds out of the earth, and then we were able to create synthetic diamonds. And De Beers said, synthetic diamonds aren't the real thing, they're fake. And these companies grew and they did their marketing and said, yes, but we don't have to pull these diamonds out of the ground. And we don't have the horrible environmental footprint of these diamonds. Now, diamonds, so De Beers and Tiffany are selling synthetic diamonds. So even De Beers that originally said, there is only one thing that you want to give your wife and that is a real diamond now has a half a billion dollar synthetic diamond business that is specifically a synthetic diamond business. So, and it's growing. So consumer behavior has basically changed. You know, some people like the traditional diamonds and leather. Some people will inevitably like this new thing. So this is why I say it's a threat, but it's also an opportunity. Because Imagine having that building over there and being able to say, we can produce cellular leather in any color that you want, any grade that you want, with zero carbon footprint, zero supply chains, zero logistics, guaranteed price, guaranteed supply, and now you start seeing why some of these newer things are attractive. So, and this is sort of where it brings us to, just because we can do something doesn't mean we should, but there are all these other forces around us that mean that this thing that we'd like to kick into the bushes, because it doesn't gel with our business very well, actually, there's a market demand. So, yeah, but cows are safe for many decades to come. But there is an opportunity to provide new kinds of materials across the world and actually spin up multi-billion dollar businesses. And, though, and big companies are buying. There we go. I think that's it. There we go. Any other questions? I think we, have, we are now out of time. So thank you very much for your yeah. question. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would like to ask, uh, how do you think that uh, it's going to evolution, uh, how is going to be the evolution of the workers in a world that we are now invest in uh, technology, in uh, artificial intelligence, uh, machines? How do you think? I miss it, so I could, the, it was a little bit echoey. I couldn't quite make the question out. So, was the question to do with investment in technologies or investment in areas? Yeah, I'm... Yeah, okay. Um, so, ultimately, the products that you are making, you're making the products for the customer. Your customers are king. If your customers say, this is what we want, and you're making it, then they'll buy it. If customers are saying, we want this, and you're not making it, they'll buy it from somewhere else. So customer's king. So I know that there's a panel basically looking at consumer behaviors, but increasingly when we have a look at certainly younger generations, kind of 30 years and below, they tend to care much more about people, planet, and purpose. So from an investment perspective, how do you align with people, planet, and purpose? Because you can invest in technology, but actually should you, you know, and that's all very well and good, but actually if you are selling to consumers and your consumers increasingly are buying from your competitors like Patagonia because Patagonia's values are we care about the environment deeply and we recycle and upscale, upscale your products rather than just recycling them, then look at company values first. It's look at marketing and messaging. You know, increasingly we're moving away from sustainable business to regenerative business. So when we have a look at any industry, every industry has got its own commodities. It's like smartphones are a commodity. But why do some of you buy Samsung or Apple 
rather than Oppo or Huawei. You know, quite a lot of people buy Apple phones because Apple promotes privacy. You know, they make a good product, but actually it's not the best product. So this is where, when we have a look at sort of technology, people and processes and markets and things, this is where really I'd suggest you actually have a look at the company values first because you don't have to spend any money on that. So have a look at the values that your customers value. Have a look at your own company's value and purpose. And then once you understand how to align that to what your customers want, that then drives downward investment into whatever it happens to be. New designs, new materials, new manufacturing technologies, and so on and so forth. So does that make sense? Yes, I'm good, thank you. There we go. I think we are now out of time. <laughs> so thank you very much for your questions, and thank you for being a great audience. Take care. Thank you, Mr. Griffin.